Um, <laughs> give him her full attention. Thanks, Ben. <laughs> My message is probably one of the simpler ones to understand here, but I think it can also sometimes be the most one of the most challenging but yet rewarding parts of this sort of ancestral community. And the message is to find your why. Why are you here on this planet? I believe, I think that our ancestors were very connected to that why, and we've got evidence that you saw from the video that Pilar showed and, and from the uh, the slide this morning um, from Mel Connor with the Mangango nuts, if you remember that. Um, the slide, or the uh, the video that the Pilar showed of, of the effort, the painstaking effort that people used to go through just to even eat, survive. And coupled inside this, I think is, there's a couple things going on here. The why to me is this attitude of, of self-achievement that is coupled with like a greater meaning and purpose in our lives. When we go in and aspire to do something that's way beyond our comfort zone, something that is difficult, that's challenging, that asks more of us, and yet we're doing it for this like greater good. And it comes back to almost this like gut level feeling. I don't know if you guys have seen a TED talk of how great leaders inspire action. I'm addicted to TED Talk, and I got to profess my love to Dr. Walls a minute ago for her TED Talk. And it, it, even in our, inside of our brain, right, the, you've got the neocortex, the outer layers of the brain, and the limbic brain is the deeper brain, deeper mind. Uh, that why that we talk about, the, this, this purpose, is almost a, a gut-level feeling that's hard to even articulate in the words, because it's actually the neocortex that regulates and, and, and helps us with language. The deeper limbic brains are the ones that control sort of this like unconscious, subconscious, whatever you like to call it, drive to to achieve, to live for something more. And yet, I think something that's just as toxic as gluten in our environment is this attitude of just sort of complacency and the status quo and comfort. And, I mean, we we um, we. Are, are naturally meant to go through periods of comfort, but I think we're also meant to go through, as Nassim Taleb mentioned this morning, something more, something that's variable, something that challenges us, something that pushes us way outside of our perceived limitations. And, you know, it's not always easy. I know for me in periods of my life, when I've connected to that source, things have gone great. Like when I've struggled most, it's been when I've been disconnected from that. And that's just anecdotal evidence, but I'll give you an example. I was 19 years old and I got to go and release a book on like Larry King and Oprah. Overnight, my life changed. I went from being a freshman student at the University of Georgia to now like full-time traveling business, you know, speakers for schools, businesses, and military. Um, when my book first came out, I traveled about 60 cities in 90 days and wasn't living this whole no excuses lifestyle, you know, that I was supposed to talk about. It was long before I knew the paleo diet. The book was released in 2005 and I certainly wasn't eating paleo. I, uh, in a period of about a three month span, and I, I, I push off my workout in the next day, the next day, no exercise, no activity. I'm sitting in a wheelchair most times. So it's not really much slow moving activity. And uh, to top it off, you know, I'm eating room service, hotel food or airport food. And so, um, you know, maybe an extra dessert, an extra dessert. I'm looking in the mirror one day, like three months into this. And I realized that this guy that's like looking back at me, like barely resembled this athlete, this wrestler from high school that I was supposed to be speaking about. Because he had gained like 30 pounds in that like three months. Like 30 pounds on my frame is like belly and cheeks 30 pounds, right? No hiding my 30 pounds, I assure you. And I remember going through this and, and I'd stand up on stage and I'd talk to other people about not making excuses in their own life. And then every excuse that I was making would go and flood through mine. And I realized then that probably one of the most underrated leadership characteristics in general is just authenticity. Like living and practicing the message that we talk about. Because the thought that kept going through my head is you are not living this message. And for a while I felt like a fraud. And it wasn't until I reversed that and changed that that that, that things started to go into change. And in many ways, you know, kind of snapped out of it and just the irony of the fact that I'd become maybe one of the greatest living oxymorons to ever have existed, living the life as the depressed motivational speaker. That's a bad combination, I assure you. Not something I recommend. There are two things that started happening now. One, I had lost sense of why I was doing what I was doing. I had 
gone after this path of, of, of pursuing, you know, a paycheck or pursuing, you know, some um, obscure form, you know, of, of way that we, you know, monitor success instead of really going after to go and see, like, how can I be the best possible speaker I can and why would I want to do that? Like, and people frequently, after, you know, after I started connecting that why again, people would come up and say things as powerful as the story stopped them from going as far as suicide. And, and all of a sudden then it started to go and change. And around that time, I met Rob Wolf. It was in 2008. And for many of you in this room, if Rob's touched your life in any way, and I'm sure many of the other, you know, uh, thought leaders in this community, I mean, have touched all of our lives in a very profound way. And it, it changed me. The, I started pursuing this sort of this ancestral way of living. And, and I mean, for the last, me and my best friend Joey sitting here, we've been doing it now for the last, five years or so since 2008 and I mean I, I can't even I don't even think that's almost enough time seven years for one complete scalable turnover and it's like I don't even think I'm the same person I was back then and and it's allowed me to go and reach for something so much beyond what I was capable of before and I think in an effect what I'd want you to go and leave here is to go and just to have that thought for yourself you might think like okay I'm just an everyday person like what's my role in all this like you know if I'm just coming here to go and learn you know, some of you may have a blog, some of you may have, you know, people that you connect with. But, but, I mean, we all go through and communicate with each other on an everyday basis, right? We all go through and, and carry this message to somewhere, someone else. And what it requires, I believe, is going outside of our comfort zone, outside of our safety net. And even if that comfort zone's expanded, just maybe like the size of someone like Dr. Wall, she's reached a ton of people. But how many more people is she able to go and reach by doing something that is greatly uncomfortable for her? You know, and, and just understanding being driven that this is too important this way of life this you know uh this culture that we have that we found that we stumbled on i think is 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 one of the most important things i've ever learned in my life and through this i think we have to go through and understand that it's okay sometimes to fail there may be a ton of different whys in this room i mean there may be 50 60 you know or however many people 100 people at this conference 500 different purposes that drive us but the common thread is there is that if we're going to go and reach our human potential, I think that we have to go through some type of failure at first. It never happens when we go through and just we're comfortable with things in the status quo. When I was a um, when I was a baby, the way that my parents like taught me, I used to use a prosthetic spoon that would go and wrap around the end of my arm. I was born with congenital amputee. Doctors then and still don't have any idea really what caused the. Um, the disorder that happened, it was born with congenital amputation, the limbs never developed. And early on, though, I mean, it was tough for them at first. They they struggled because um, doctors, many of them would go and say, like, Kyle's never going to have a normal life. You know, he's never going to be able to go and do much of anything. He's You're probably going to have to feed him for the rest of his life, probably take care of him, probably have to live at home forever. And they asked an important why question of why can't Kyle lead a normal life? Had to do everything in their power to go and push me towards that because early on it had to go through those failures a ton. The prosthetic spoon though that wrap around the end of my arm, I'd use that to go and scoop up food. But we'd leave it at home and we'd go out to eat at a friend's house or restaurant and not have it there. My dad saw that my mom or my grandma was feeding me when we didn't have the spoon. So he said the world's not tailored or set up for Kyle's every need. Like he's going to have to figure out how to do this on his own. And so consequently when I first learned to eat, just holding a spoon between the ends of my arms and kind of using my right arm to go and swing it around, my left arm to go and hold it the way I eat now, just with normal silverware. Like I had to go through with this failure a ton of dropping it hundreds of times over and over and over again, maybe a thousand times. And it to eventually kind of figure it out. Now in my life, there's not that many adaptations. If you guys get a glimpse, I live about 30 minutes from here, up in Swanee, uh, northeast Atlanta. Three-story townhouse, bedrooms on the top floor. Only adaptation in the entire house is I have a stool to go and get up to the bathroom sink. I have two stools in the uh, main floor to go and get up to the kitchen countertop to go and cook. Um, six months ago, I was a terrible cook, and I was like, i got to fix this part of my life. And uh, I type about 50, 60 words per minute in a normal keyboard, just using the ends of my elbows to go and hit the keys, type on a normal iPhone to text and tweet and all that. Uh, when I drive, I drive just a Dodge Durango. The only adaptations on it are just lifted up, extended pedals. I use my left foot to hit the brake, my right foot to hit the gas. It's a normal steering wheel. Put the seat up a little bit closer to the wheel. And sometimes I really freak my friends out when I answer my cell phone and I'm driving. 
Or every now and then, two coming around the corner at like a Starbucks or something like that, trying to pass on my credit card and like catch them off guard. And so I'm like, whoa, freak out, throw coffee everywhere. But had they focused on something, had they focused on this path of the all the things that were wrong with the circumstance, my life would have been very different. And I and I believe that to be the case for you know our hunter gather ancestors. I mean, if if they had only gone on the path, I mean, it's we have to be real about the challenges that we faced, right? But if they'd only gone on the path of, of seeing the challenges and seeing the victimhood and woe is me, they would have never survived. We would never be here today. It is ingrained within us to be able to go and move past things, to to be able to go and, and, and rise above the challenges that we're presented with. But sometimes now, especially over the last you know hundred years, we have gotten to become progressively more and more and more comfortable in our environment. Um. Not that long ago, Rob Wolf shared a story about three plants that were on, on his podcast. One was, it was a, um, a plant that was just exposed to a natural environment, sat outside. Another plant sat inside in, in a controlled environment, but was exposed to some stressors like sunlight and things like that. Uh, I mean, there, even beyond that, you know, temperature changes. There was another plant, though, that had like a perfect amount of sunlight, a perfect temperature and everything else. That plant died. Because we are not, you know, in, in our DNA, I believe it's, we are not coded to just go through things comfortably. It's, it's going and, and asking more. Like, what more can I go and, and do and live for? I could give countless examples. We don't have enough time for this necessarily. But it, when I was younger, with several things, um, wrestling, lifting weights, all this stuff, I lost a ton at first. I mean, there struggled. Wrestling, I lost every match in sixth grade. I started, hated the sport. I struggled at it. Before I played football and I was actually pretty good. I was playing nose guard defensive line and running back to come at me and I'd just try to take my helmet and smash it to their shins as hard as I could. The whole thing is that the defensive line is about getting lower than your opponents and nobody's getting lower than me. So in wrestling though, I lost every match in sixth grade, halfway through seventh grade, still had not won a match. Weightlifting, I started with two and a half pounds on each arm. In sixth grade, looking at these high schoolers in the weight room lifting, you know, 200 pounds in a bench press, thinking like I'll never be able to go and do that someday. And it was, um, you know, even uh, with as Kamal mentioned with the fight with mixed martial arts, I had um, people said some really harsh things. People said Kyle uh, is going to get killed in the sport and do the first televised death. If he get, you know, picked up and put it out of the cage. Someone even said, you know, behind anonymous screening, come take a chainsaw. And take my arms and legs so I can go and get on TV like Kyle. In all those instances, though, in wrestling, finally broke through, won that first match. And it changed everything. It changed that belief system. By fast forward to senior year of high school, won 36 varsity matches and placed top 12 in the nation in my weight class. Weightlifting went from 5 pounds total in a bench press with rope tied around my arms to gradually working up to lifting with chains. Had a personal best in the bench press in 2009 of 420 pounds. And MMA for three rounds, the guy that I went up against basically ran for me, didn't want to go to the ground and get choked out. And for the, as, as the fight went on, I'm sitting there in the cage and thinking like, you know, um, all the people that said the things that they said would never go and get to experience a moment this beautiful. They found it easier to go and criticize me for my dreams and going out and doing something worthy of criticism. And as a criticism of this community, I see that a lot from the conversation that Kamal and I have had of you know, sometimes there's so much like fighting over like the perfection inside. Should we eat 20% carbs or 30% carbs? Or is it, when is it okay to go and do this? Well, you know, all this stuff, when we've got a world out there that is dying, there is a great calling inside this community to go and connect, to go and say like, what is important? What is important? How can we each go outside of our comfort zone and help, you know, go towards that? So to go and close, how I kind of found purpose in my own life was I had to go back and and start to live the message that I was talking about. You know, the other half of not just doing paleo and, and, and getting my health together, but it was about, you know, going on and trying to live for, for something more. And that, in effect, is what led me and Joey and seven of our other friends out to Mount Kilimanjaro. I had hiked 12 times before we took on Kilimanjaro. Because it used to take three hours to go and get my gear set up. I'd basically take, we'd take bath towels and, uh, wrap them around my arms and then wrap a mountain bike tire around that and duct tape everything together. 
finally it had gotten some gear that was more functional, carbon fiber for my arms and my feet, and I basically just left the wheelchair at the lodge, and for um, 12 and a half days, it was a bear crawl, just down at all fours, you know, walking about half the pace of a normal group as we went along, and, and I'm sitting there looking at the bottom of this mountain, and looking up at the top, and saying, thinking like, I what did I get myself into? When you're at the bottom of Kilimanjaro, there's, um, there's like rainforest trees that are three, four times higher than the ceiling. And, uh, you're looking through these tree clearings though, and you're seeing on the top, it's snow and ice on the summit. So it looks like a totally different planet. And as we're going along the first couple of days, we're having a good time. You know, we're laughing, joking with each other. It's like, you know, I'm just locked in about six to seven hours per day in this like bear crawl. And by the third day, my arms and my feet started, by the third day, my arms and my feet started swelling up a lot. And by the fourth day, it was basically all I could think about. The pain had become so bad, it was like hard to concentrate on anything else. And we had projected it's going to take 15 days to reach the summit. So the fourth day, we crossed up above the tree line. My friend, we were, you know, that I was laughing and joking with before, and now, like, I could barely, like, even, you know, stomach to, like, hear them laughing and joking. So I was in a totally different place. Mentally, I could only think about that pain. I told them, I was like, just go and hike ahead. And I'll catch up. So they did, and um, hiked ahead about 20 minutes. I was with a few of our, of our guides and just kind of alone in my thoughts and I was thinking, like, if it hurts this bad on the fourth day, what's day nine going to look like? What's day 12 going to look like? And we pulled in this camp called the Chira Plateau. It was about 12,000 feet, starting to get cold outside. And a bunch, there's maybe 100 or so other climbers there in the mountain. And as uh, so we pulled into the camp, my friends that had made it before you know, shared our story, what we were doing. People wanted to meet and take pictures and stuff like that. And like normally it would have been something I would have loved to have done at that point. Like I was, I was just in so much pain. I told him, I was like, I just need to be alone. And it was, felt discouraged, dejected, went and walked inside my tent and lay there by myself on top of my sleeping bag for a while. And about an hour just lay there and cried. And I started thinking, I was like, one of the reasons why we were there was to provide hope for some of our heroes in the military that had sacrificed their limbs literally for our freedom. I thought this isn't going to provide a whole lot of hope for these troops now that I can't even make it a third of the way up this mountain. I really started crying when I started thinking about a promise that I was close to breaking. And it was from a mom that I met out in Arizona before we left for the trip, and her name was Vicki. She'd been a mother of a Marine who in May of 2011 had lost his life in a firefight in Afghanistan and had saved several other Marines before he passed away. His name is Corey Johnson. So he had, he had a wife and three daughters that one daughter he hadn't met yet she had been born after his last deployment. And she said he had this passion to travel, to see the world. To, she would talk about climbing Kilimanjaro and out of the blue in this gym, she looked me in the eye and she asked me, would you promise to bring Corey's ashes to the summit? I promised her there that I would. And laying in that tent, I can tell you that was the only thing in that moment, in that darkest moment that kept me going. And I, I think in order for any of us to reach that potential and what we're capable of in our lives, we have to find a why. Corey in that moment became my why. The pain didn't go away, but I, I got real with where I was pain threshold wise, and I made a decision there in that moment. I was like, I'm not going to come back home and tell Vicky that I didn't make it. And so we decided to look at our alternatives and decided to go up and take a risk on a route that was called the Western Breach up the western side of the mountain that fewer than 1% of climbers on Kilimanjaro take because it's a route that's full of ice and snow, basically. So with a small ice bike fitted for my arm, uh, the ice bike in my right arm was kind of malfunctioning. and, and Smaller ice spikes for my feet. Uh, my right arm was basically useless because of malfunctioning ice spike. I had three points of contact for the ninth day, and we're taking on. We had to pass through three thousand feet of ice and snow. So 
we're going along and, and then the rule of mount climbing is always have three points of contact down at all times. So I'm breaking this rule already without my malfunction ice pipe. And started off in these ice fields. The only thing you could see is just it'd go on for hundreds of feet at a time. And just we started at 2 a.m., 3 a.m. We we're hiking. Woke up at 2. You could just barely see just, you know, 10, 15 feet in front of you from your headlamp that's shining off the ground. And so as we're going through these ice fields, I would I'd get my firm footing and just stack and punch into the ice and step through these ice fields, just punch through the ice. Halfway through this first big field, I didn't punch into the ice hard enough. The ice spike on my left arm slid out from underneath me. I went belly down on the sheet of ice and slid several feet in a second. My guide jumped on me, bear hugged me, probably saved my life. My heart rate was through the roof. You know, tunnel vision came in, all that, you know, nervous system response that we know too well. I mean, the cord was all jacked. It was my... Uh, and the immediate thing that came into my head then in that moment, there was a mantra that just like kept repeating over and over and over again that I'd heard from a Navy SEAL. And the mantra was, not dead, can't quit. And I just kept repeating this, not dead, can't quit. And I'd ask myself periodically throughout that day, are you dead? Nope, can't quit. It was, um, it was 12 hours across through the Western Breach. Slept at 18,500 feet, woke up with a layer of ice on top of our sleeping bags and sleeping through to a tent. And that next morning, just pushed through another, uh, it was uh, 900 feet, 1,000 feet to go, stand at the roof of Africa, 19,340 feet. Got to go and take it in for about an hour almost before anyone showed up, any you know, other climbers, and um, got to have that time to go and pay tribute to Corey. And the most amazing thing happened, it took us two and a half days to come back down the mountain. And as we came back down, the very next day, we got to take a shower, which was pretty awesome. Hadn't showered in 12 and a half days. But we got to go and visit a school for kids with disabilities. And at this school, there were about 80 blind students, 25 albino students. And these kids had been, because of their disability in Africa, were cast out of their families, couldn't contribute to the subsistence culture. And they were orphans. Uh, and allowed to go to uh, private school because of being blind and albino. About a hundred of them went and gathered around me, and I was giving them a talk, translated to their headmaster in Swahili. And I was either about ten years old, so I'm talking to them and you know toned down a little bit. You know, we're talking about climbing this big mountain in their backyard, but the kids got so excited and fired up, they just like started spontaneously on their own, like chanting something, like over and over and over again. And so I was like asking their headmaster, like, what are they chanting? What are they chanting? They're chanting in Swahili. So he has them start chanting in English. And what they were chanting was, anything is possible. Anything is possible. Anything is possible. I sat back there, though, and I was, like, reflecting on that. And I was like, I don't think this would have been possible for me if, if I didn't have, like, Corey in that moment becoming my wife. And I, I don't think that any of us can reach our potential in our lives and, you know, do what we're capable of doing and help the people that we are if we don't find ours. So I challenge you, you know, find your why. Find your truth and realize then I think anything really is possible. Thank you guys very much. I'm guessing there might be a question or two, maybe. Uh, um, if you have a question, then line on up here. I have a lot of questions. Right. Uh, <laughs> actually, I read Kyle's book, and I have a question for every page. So <laughs> sure that, um, Yo, I've done interviews with Howard Stern, too, and he didn't hold back too much, so you guys don't have to. <laughs> okay. So, um, so Kyle's book is called No Excuses, and uh, my question is, I think you wrote it when you were 19. 19, yeah. Um, what's it like to have that strength of character when you're young? Because when I was 19, uh, you know, <laughs> I, had, I had no idea about anything. Um, I had a sort of inside joke with a friend here that if we wrote a book, it would be called Excuses. <laughs> uh, excuses. So, um, so, 
were you just always like that? Did you have that, you know, that will or did that develop over time? Well, I see my friend Joey smirking because he knows every excuse that I've ever made in my life and there are plenty. Uh, now, man, it's, it's something where I, I think that some of the experiences that we have sometimes, you know, it does shape us into who we are. And I know that you've gone through your challenges too. And everybody in this room has got some type of disability, some type of challenge. For me, you can look at me and see that I was born a little bit different, and I can't look at you and see your biggest challenges. But I think it is one of the one things that kind of unites every single person on this planet, so we all have something. And the coolest part, I think, about this ancestral community is that like, a lot of us are brought here as a consequence of a challenge. You know, Whether it is some type of autoimmune disease that you would never be able to see on the outside until maybe the later physical manifestations of it, but... It, it, it causes us to go in, in that, in those sometimes darkest moments to like introspect and to grow. And I think it's through that crucible, like we become a little bit better. But I mean, a lot's changed in uh, a couple of years in, in the book. I was, Joey and I went back and like we're reading like the dietary recommendations that I gave people. And I'm like, this is a disaster. <laughs> There's got to be a revised version right now. So if you guys see that, then uh, keep, keep that in mind. It's, it's pretty bad. But now, I mean, we're on, we're on a mission. One of the next steps I want to go and do is try to go and incorporate. Last year, I got to go and give probably close to 100 speeches and maybe speak to about a quarter million people. And, you know, in every speech that I gave, I got to talk, talk maybe for three, four minutes about paleo at least to kind of inter interject that in there. And it's been so cool to see just like the growth that this is like the rise that this is having. And, and before, five years ago, no one had any idea what it was, right? And now it's like we're, we're making headway, but it's it's to go and realize that like every one of us in here has a role. It's, it's not just Dr. Walls and Rob Wolf and you know Chris Cresser. I mean, it's like every one of us in here with every single conversation that we have, like it has the ability to be able to go out and, and help other people, and it's through our experience. And sometimes those vulnerabilities, those challenges that brought you here, like those can be some of the greatest gifts that we've ever been given. So uh, if nobody else has any questions, Kyle will. Oh, there's one. I was just curious in your uh, wrestling career, what were some of your power moves, and how did you learn to adapt them? <laughs> um, you know, it's funny. Like I couldn't emulate what other people were doing in wrestling. So I, me and my dad and my coach would go and like they would wrestle on their hands and knees and try to get down from my perspective to go and see what would work. And um, I remember the first match that I won, and it was like. Uh, grab the kid's arm and like just like manage to like flip him and land on top of him and like I was more shocked than he was I think <laughs> and actually the funny thing was leading up to that in sixth grade so I said like, I lost every match in seventh grade I had lost every match up until halfway through that season but prior to signing up in seventh grade my dad sat me down and he had this conversation with me he, I knew that he had been a successful collegiate wrestler and he said I want you to know something he said when I first started he said I didn't win a single match my first year either he said, hardly anybody wins a match their first year in wrestling. He said, but everybody's going to go and every, every, you know, first year person has to go up against a second year person. So he's like, if you sign up this year, you're going to find somebody who's their first year and you're going to beat them. And, uh, so I believed him and signed up. And I was just interviewing people for my book. I was interviewing my grandpa, my dad's dad for this book. And I asked him, I was like, what was it like for my dad losing every single one of these matches his first year? How did he deal with it? He was like, what? That was a complete lie. So, <laughs> but it was an effective one. I probably wouldn't be here if it wasn't for it. <laughs> so I know that uh, when you uh, have like a, a pattern or a history of like not living up to the way other people do or living in a different way, and then you kind of buck that trend, you become successful in some way. There's there's a weird societal pressure to like be ashamed of that almost, yeah. or to like go back to your place. Uh, what, did you experience that? And if so, how did you deal with it? That's a really good question. Um, Jim Rohn, this is not scientific, but he's one of my favorite motivational speakers of all time. And he said that we're probably most influenced in our lives by the five people we spend the most time with. And I think it's true that sometimes when we do go and expand and sort of transcend where we were before, sometimes it exposes almost like a mirror, it exposes other, other people's vulnerabilities and sort of expresses their, their challenges or, or, you know, weaknesses, whatever. And I think it's also, there's probably some 
evolutionary psychology protective mechanism going on there, right? Like we go and expand ourselves and go and expose ourselves to failure. Well, failure in a hunter-gatherer world would have meant death. And we've got to realize now that that barometer is different. And in a lot of ways, we have to kind of find it from within. And I'm really glad my grandmother, especially, she used to teach me that randomly in grocery stores. And she would go and take me and just help me be comfortable with myself and go and take me and set me at the grocery store and just practice meeting people. Going out to reach out and shake their hand. Some of my friends that I've already gotten to meet here, you guys know when I meet you, my first instinct is to reach out and shake your hand. This is what she had taught me there. And it was, uh, she said, once people can hear your voice, you can see your face, they can shake your hand, this ability will fade away. Something, something we'll think about. And I'd say 99 times out of 100, it goes over really smooth without a hitch. I'll reach out and shake somebody's hand and get like a normal handshake back. There is like one time out of 100, I'll reach out and go and shake somebody's hand. I just see them like freeze and panic. But like, whoa, this guy doesn't have a hand. What does he expect me to do? And I'll just hang out and wait. Eventually, we'll come in for like a fist bump or elbow tap. <laughs> Make it up some secret amputee handshake on the fly. But I think it's, it, we have to realize then that, you know, we, we are the ones that get to go in to choose every moment, every day, whether we go down that path of living up to others' expectations or if we go in and, and, you know, and, and, and are guided by the people that lift us up, but also to just ask a little bit more of ourselves and just go and question, like, what is really possible in my life if I sort of let go of some of these excuses and all this other stuff and all those other limiting beliefs that other people have about us? I think it's, I think it's a really important thing to introspect. It's, it's a really cool question. Thanks. I actually have another question. Yeah. Um, so when you're doing something challenging like uh, climbing a very large mountain, um, I can't relate to that kind of thing. And I'm wondering, since you do that sort of thing a lot, do you have a method to relax um, or to, you know, um, whether it's sitting, watching TV or meditating or I don't know what, um, to make those things easier. Yeah, you know, it's the crazy thing is like, I mean, it, <laughs> in my life, I, I think I, I will spend a significant amount of time. The whole like idea of like the sun, you know, being down for like 14 hours in the, in the winter and it being dark outside. Like I, I tell myself that all the time when I want to go and sleep for like 12 hours straight. Um, I, I do, you think it's such an important thing, right? It's that natural like ebb and flow of life. It's not about resisting and being motivated every single day to go and achieve things, realizing that some moments you just got to take a step back and, you know, and kind of recollect, refocus. Frankly, it's the people that pretend to be positive 365 days a year that are like the hard chargers all the time. Like those are the people that really freak me out. Those are people that are hiding something serious, you know? <laughs> I think it is such an important thing. I mean, just to be able to enjoy this path that we're on. But sometimes in order to get to that place of enjoyment, we have to go through that period of being uncomfortable first. I mean, give you, for instance, if you're in a job that you can't stand, you know, and you go to work every single day and you spend so much of your time doing that, it might be comfortable to go and stay inside that job. But what stressors is that causing on your life on an unconscious level that could be changed as a consequence of pursuing something greater? It might be fearful to go out and to go and take on and do something new, but, and it might be really difficult at first. But I don't think that that's necessarily a bad thing. I think as long as we really love and have passion for what we're doing, then it that entire um, perspective changes. So um, Kyle will also be uh, hosting a workshop on uh, a combat movement session that might be full, but uh, it's at 9 a.m. on Saturday. So uh, what? Oh, hello. Um, now we'll break for uh, about 10 minutes uh, for networking sessions. Um, and if you look on your schedule, uh, there's a networking session for scientists, uh, self-experimenters, and patients, one for providers, healthcare providers, and business owners, uh, another one for policy and information sharing, and the last one for fitness. Um, and those take up these two rooms as well as Atlanta 1 and 2 and Atlanta 3. Thank you.